That music is actually his music for a ringtone for me. And people think, you like that? I'm like, yeah, sorry. Anyway, sorry. Hi, I'm Janet, and if you don't know me, I, I'm an editor of a couple literary magazines, and the guy that was a feature here last week, I want his stories to appear in issues in every issue because they're just awesome little stories. And see what I can do. Y'all yeah, see what I can do. And if they're going to be short, I'll have to put a couple in one issue and a couple in the next issue because I can do that because I'm the editor lady. I'm the boss lady. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, and if you don't know my writing, which why would you because i just recently moved from chicago a lot of what i write about is about death sorry what you know we have to always deal with that you know death um, and taxes. <laughs> i've only written one thing about taxes and that was because i lived in illinois and i didn't have a goddamn job and they um said oh you made a couple a little bit of interest on an investment that you had from before and you owe three hundred dollars to us for it i'm like you've got to be shitting me so i'm not living in illinois anymore oh, it's pretty much broken <sighs> i won't discuss the liberal ways of the chicago versus the rest of the state i won't do it i won't do it i love the town um but i either write about things like death or i write about sexism because i worked as an acquaintance rape work self facilitator for years so I have that stuff in there. Um, this of my first of my three, this is all from the book called Let Me See You Stripped. Let Me See You Stripped. Um, it is a little mini book from a collection book of mine called Partial Nudity, because I tell you a little bit about myself in them. And this one, the first one is called Left With The Hole. <laughs> or something. This is called Left with the Hole. <laughs> you see those TV shows or even the movies where some protagonist would fall into a coma. I don't know from what, a uh, gunshot, a uh, car crash. And every time they'd wake up from their coma, they'd be under for like four weeks or four years. And they'd come to and they'd be mentally just fine. And they'd talk in complete sentences, and they'd remember what happened to them right up until the catastrophe. But let me be the voice of experience. In the real world, that's not the way it goes. You don't remember what happened to you right before the coma began. You'll wake up confused because your long-term memory never got the chance to save your short-term memory from that fateful day. When you wake up, you'll have to train yourself how to walk and talk and eat. You'll fall out of your hospital bed trying to leave. You'll want to kill the people that did this to you. You'll want to scream your story to the world and they'll have to strap you in restraints at night. You know, for your own good. You want to rip that food tube out of you and you'll be afraid to put food into your mouth because it's been so long. Now, look, you have to remind yourself. You've done this before. It's not hard. Everyone else does it. Put food on a fork. Put the fork in your mouth. Remove fork. Start chewing. It's that simple. I know it seems strange, but you can do it. You'll have to build your life again. Piece by piece. I mean, you did this when you were a child, when you were little. You're an adult now. You can retrain yourself. People will ask you if you remember what happened to you that fateful day. And they'll think that it's just like the movies and that everyone just snaps out of the coma. Good as new. You won't know how to tell them that you'll never be as good as new. <laughs> Nothing you can tell them will make them understand that even though you woke up, <laughs> that bastards who did this to you, they took so much <laughs> that you can't even remember the seconds before your life was forever changed for the worse. <laughs> You're left at the hall, and they even took your memories of the last seconds of your life from you.
is not about that. <laughs> this one is called So. And it is called So because I say so, so much in it. <laughs> this poem is called So. So in the hotel I was in, I didn't have a continental breakfast, so I looked for a diner for a bagel for breakfast. So I pulled into some dive and I just sat there. I kept my head down. I don't like looking at strangers. So I kept my head down looking at my writings. And I didn't even notice my, my head was buried in my words. But the lady walked over and dropped the bomb of liquid into the coffee cup right there in front of me into my upturned glass. I watched this black mass sloshing around, contained but violent, as she walked away. I don't like coffee, you see. So I could have just stopped her, said, no thanks. But this was my fault, as much as it was hers. So there I was, staring at this coffee that I don't even like. So, so I've got this Bailey's flask in my pocket. I guess that tells you something about me. But if I'm going to drink coffee, I'll sweeten it any way I can. So my eyes dart to the left, then to the right. Make sure nobody's watching me. So I open up the flask under the table, then slowly drizzle in the cream. I watch it form a mushroom cloud from within that contained bomb. I, I try to remember where I am, where I've been. I, I didn't know that on the other side of the country that you had just died. So I looked at my coffee that I don't even like and wondered if I should drink. I guess there's more of my sexism, and yeah, I guess this is a true story, but whatever. They all are, I guess, in some level. This is called Scratch at the Surface. You don't have to pull out the book for men to know how men degrade the weaker sex, or even assault women in the English language. Hey, they even try to make it sound nice. Think it's a compliment to call us a honey, a fox, a pumpkin, they're a cougar, or even a hot chick. But if calling us by animals is too degrading, I can still be your babe. I can still be your girl. I mean, calling us less than adult can still be degrading. But I get furious when I'm walking in a tank top, you know, because it's hot outside, and a semi or a truck honks their horn. I mean, do they think honking their horn is a compliment? Or are they just too blizzy horn blowing their horns so they can show off their big rig? I thought the big for me, book for men covered all of the bases, even with sex in terms men understood. Banging, hammering, nailing, screwing, scoring. But I was in a car because it was warm. I was wearing a tank top. Again, a truck driver was, you know, it's a truck, truck, truck driver sexual turn on. So I got honked at while in a car by a semi driver while sitting in this car going down the highway. And that's when I heard one more term for women. Someone informed me that after they tr their, their truck horn blares, the truck driver will radio ahead to other semis and tell them the color, make, and model of a car with a good looking seat cover. Wow, a seat cover. 
thanks. <laughs> no, I'm reduced to not even good looking, I'm just reduced to good looking upholstery. Something that you drape over or something and that you sit on. <laughs> like, we can't stay pretty after you've kept us down for years before you get something prettier to replace us. So I sit in my car, covering myself whenever we're near a truck, and I think of the book for men, with jokes objectifying women, or reminding us all of a bush, a slit, or a crack, a box, a hole, or a farm implement, like a hoe. But I'm telling you, baby doll, as thorough as that handbook seems, it doesn't even scratch the surface. Janet!